This is the lecture presentation for Chapter 7 material, where we will be discussing solutions and colloids. The outline for this chapter is we'll have a brief introduction, then we'll talk a little bit about the dissolution process, actually creating a solution. We'll talk about electrolytes, which are actually charge-carrying solutions, talk a little bit about solubility, talk quite a bit about colligative properties, and then end with a short discussion on colloids. So what is a solution? A solution is a homogeneous mixture that contains two or more substances. An example of that would be a salt water solution. So I have two things in a salt water solution. I have salt and I have water. And to be a homogeneous solution, I can't see any phases that are separate from each other. So in this case, once I poured in the salt and stirred it up a little bit, I will only see one homogeneous mixture. Depending on which is the major component and which is the minor component, I'm going to have a difference in what my solution is. For example, in the case of the salt water here, my major component, we're going to call that the solvent. And that's going to be the water in this case. And my minor component, it's going to be dissolved in my water. And that's going to be called a solute. OK, so let's look at the five characteristics of a solution. One, it's got to be homogeneous. I cannot distinguish the components from each other. The physical state of the solution is typically the name of the solvent. So in this case, this is going to be an aqueous solution where I take water and salt. The dissolved solute does not settle out or separate from the solution, even over time. Otherwise, it's not a true solution. The components of the solution must be evenly dispersed. That sort of talks about being homogeneous again. And that includes looking at it microscopically. And finally, the components consist of separate molecules, atoms, or ions when you put everything all together. We've already mentioned what the definition of a solution is, a homogeneous mixture that contains two or more substances, the solvent and the solute. Again, the solvent is the major component, and the solute is the minor component. There are nine different types of solutions that we could actually have, depending on what my solute is, the phase of it, and my solvent, and the phase of that one. For example, if my solute is a gas, that's my minor component, my solvent can either be a gas, a liquid, or solid. If my solute is a liquid, my solvent can either be a gas, a liquid, or a solid. If my solute is a solid, which is the normal case when we talk about chemistry in the laboratory anyway, my solvent can be a gas, liquid, or solid. And here are some examples of that. And I've just made this big table. I'm now going to talk about each one of these individually briefly and just sort of give it an example. And I'll just sort of look at these examples here as I've listed them here. And note there are many examples of all of these. Let's start off and look at three examples where my solute in each case is a gas and my solvent is varied from a gas to a liquid to a solid. So in my first example out here, I could have oxygen dissolved in nitrogen. An example of that would be air. So if I look at air, most of it is nitrogen. So over 78% is nitrogen. Only 20.946% is actually oxygen. So if I look at this sort of ongoing diagram here, all of the blue spheres here would be nitrogen, and the red ones, which are my solute, would be oxygen. Notice that there are some other atoms that float by occasionally also because in this solution I have more than two components. My solvent is going to be nitrogen and all of these components here will be my solute. If we look at examples of gas in a liquid, we can look no further than looking at carbonated water. For example, in these European bubbly waters, I have CO2 dissolved in water. 
over here in the United States, which is a little more common, is actually having CO2 gas dissolved in things like soda. If I look at gas in a solid, that is not very common at all. One example that we can think of that is common is actually hydrogen dissolved in palladium. So if I look at this crystal structure here, where these gray spheres are actually my palladium, I can actually have the minor component, hydrogen gas, actually dissolved in it. People actually are experimenting with using this as a way to trap or store hydrogen gas being used for fuels. A palladium catalyst, I can store hydrogen in it. When I need that, I just need to heat this all up, release the hydrogen, and then burn it. This is also down here, just an example of the hydrogen being trapped down in the palladium catalyst. Examples of a solution where my solute is a liquid and my solvent is either a gas, a liquid, or a solid are shown here. The first one up here, number four, is where my solute is a liquid, my solvent is a gas. An example of that would be water vapor in the air. For example, here is a steamer. This vapor coming out here is actually water liquid in the air, not gas. Another example would be low clouds or fog in the air. In these cases, these are small water droplets dispersed in nitrogen, dispersed in the air. My fifth example here would be where my sol solvent is a liquid and my solute is a liquid. An example of that would be alcohol in water or water in alcohol. In the first case here that I've shown, 70% rubbing alcohol, 30% water. So in this case, my solvent would be liquid alcohol and my solute would be water. In the example of vanilla, I have a very small percent alcohol in a large percent of water. So in this case, the alcohol would be my solute and the water would be my solvent. Other examples of alcohol in water include beverages like Alaskan white amber ale or tequila or this sort of outlawed whiskey here. Depending on which one is in higher concentration, that will determine which one is the solute and which one is the solvent. Another example here of a solution is a liquid in a solid. Probably the most prominent example of that is actually mercury dissolved in copper, which is going to make in a mercury amalgam. And we're probably most used to that as being a filling. Common today, is actually having a ceramic filling. Back in the 1950s and 60s, the most common type of filling is actually in a mercury amalgam, where they take mercury, dissolve it in copper, and actually it becomes sort of a liquid that can harden after a period of time. And so that's what's shown here in this example of a coin, putting a drop of mercury on it, it actually forms mercury inside the copper or a solution of liquid in solid. And finally, examples where my solute is a solid and my solvent is either gas, liquid, or solid. Examples of the first one up here are iodine in nitrogen, where again, my example, my solvent in this case is air, and I can actually have solid vapor from the iodine actually suspended in air. An example of a solid in a liquid is just sodium chloride in water. So we take sodium chloride, we dissolve it in water, and that's a solution of salt water. There is more salt water on the earth than anywhere else we know of. In fact, if we were to look at ocean water, a large percentage of that water, the solute, is actually chlorine, but there are other solids also dissolved in ocean water. They include sodium, magnesium, sulfur, calcium, potassium, and this other down here, which is a small percentage. People have actually tried mining the ocean to try to extract this small percentage of gold, platinum, and palladium from this 0.7% solute dissolved in water. And finally, 
a solution of a solid in a solid is an example of that would be metal alloys. In this case, the one we're looking at here is I have zinc dissolved in copper. That would just be a brass alloy. And so if we look at that, my zinc in this case is my solute. It's in lower concentration than my copper. And we can think of that as like a brass doorknob. When we make a solution, there are several terms associated with that process. Two of them are soluble and insoluble. And most of the time, that is associated with a solute that is a solid and the solvent, which is a liquid. So if I have molecules of solute that are capable of being dissolved in a solvent, we say that that solute is soluble in the solvent. If it is incapable of being dissolved in a solvent, we call them insoluble. For example, if I take some copper sulfate and I actually put some of it in water and stir it, the copper sulfate actually dissolves in the water, making a solution. The copper sulfate is then soluble in water. If I take copper carbonate and put it in some water, the copper carbonate just falls to the bottom. No matter how much I stir it, I do not form a homogeneous mixture. Therefore, the copper carbonate is insoluble in water. When I have a liquid solute and a liquid solvent, we use the terms miscible and immiscible to describe whether I can form a solution or not. So miscible says I have molecules that are a solute, and they do mix together with my solvent, which means they're capable of being dissolved in a solvent. We call them miscible. For example, if I put some ethanol in water, I can only see one homogeneous phase. So we say that the ethanol is miscible with the water. If I have molecules that do not mix and are not capable of being dissolved, we call those solutes immiscible. So for an example, if I take hexane and I put it in some water, they do not mix with each other. The hexane sort of floats on top of the water. We say that this is an immiscible mixture of two different materials. Miscible and immiscible. Soluble and insoluble. Aqueous solutions are very common in chemistry of living organisms. In fact, most of the chemical reactions that go on in a living organism like your body are actually water-based or aqueous chemical reactions in which a solution is made. In this section, we'll talk about the basic principles behind dissolution, talking about solubility and insolubility. We're now going to talk about the dissolution process, the process of making a solution. And in this case, we're going to use water as our sort of solvent. That's because it is considered literally the universal solvent. So if I make use water as a solvent, this is going to be an aqueous solution, a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances where water is my solvent. It is the universal solvent, because, one, because of its bent shape and also because of the large electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen. In other words, it's a very polar molecule. If we look at this part of the molecule, notice I put down a partial negative charge because of the electrons and because of the electronegativity of oxygen being 3.5 relative to this side of the molecule, which has a partial positive charge on it, which will attract negative things. So let's look at the solvation process. Again, aqueous solution. In this case, we're going to look at sodium chloride. So this structure down here represents a crystal of sodium chloride.
These molecules all up here represent my water molecules. Notice the negative chlorine here is sort of attracted toward this positive hydrogen. That's what this sort of dots really mean. And if you look at also, my sodium, which is positive, is attracted toward my negative oxygen molecule. Because of that attraction, the bonds between the water, this attraction between the water and the ions here is going to be greater than the attraction between the sodium and chlorine. Eventually, I sort of pull off one chlorine atom and one sodium chlor atom, and they're surrounded by water molecules. Here, the delta T just means time. If I let time go on a little bit longer, more and more chlorine and sodium ions within my crystalline structure sort of get pulled away and solvated by the water. Solvated means surrounded by water molecules. If I wait a little bit longer, eventually all of my sodium chloride becomes surrounded by water and none of the sodium and none of the chlorine are actually forming an ionic bond anymore. They've been dissolved. There are three things that need to happen in order for a solute to actually be dissolved in a solvent. There are three types of intermolecular attractive forces that influence whether substances will form a solution. In the case of sodium chloride in water, I need to actually either break up or form new intermolecular forces. The first thing that must happen is I must break up the solute, solute, either intermolecular or bonding forces. In the case of sodium chloride, I actually need to break up those ionic bonds that actually hold sodium chloride together in a crystalline form. I also, at the same time, must break up the solvent, solvent intermolecular forces. The largest in water would be my hydrogen bonds that must be broken, but that also includes the dispersion forces between water and the dipole-dipole forces between water. And finally, I must actually form new intermolecular forces must be formed between my solute and my solvent. In the case of sodium and chloride, I must form new interactions with my water. So my sodium, must interact and form new intermolecular forces, dispersion or van der Waals forces, and dipole-dipole forces. And that's the same through with my chlorine anions. I must form new intermolecular forces must be formed. Let's now look at the energies associated with solvation. In other words, do we need to add energy to the system or is energy released from the system? Let's first look at the solvent. If I look at the solvent, in order to form a solution, I need to break up those bonds and forces that are holding the solvent molecules together. Those include both ionic bonds and intermolecular forces like London dispersion forces and like hydrogen bonding forces. In order to break up those forces, I need to add energy to the system. In other words, the heat of solvation is going to be a positive value. And then these solvent molecules then are free to react with each other or to react with any solute that might be in the solution. If we look at the solute, sort of the same argument of Applies. In order to make a solution between the solvent and the solute, I need to break up those forces holding the solute together, and they also include, include both ionic and intermolecular forces. I need to add energy to the system to break up those forces, so the heat of solvation here would also be a positive value. These two species now interact with each other and they start to create either bonds or forces. These are typically intermolecular forces and so my heat of solvation would be a negative value. In other words, 
energy is released and oftentimes in the form of heat. And now I have a true solution. So if my overall solvation process is exothermic, meaning I dissolve something, I release energy or heat, that's going to be an exothermic reaction. So I need to break up my solvent-solvent interactions. I need to break up my solute-solute. And then I'm going to create or release energy when I create new interactions. If that total energy is greater than the sum of my breaking process, I have a net total energy that's being released. I'm going to release a little bit of energy. In other words, that's going to be an exothermic reaction. So in this case, my delta H of solution is going to be negative. If I have an endothermic dissolution process, in this case, the energy required to break up my solvent solvent or my solute solvent is actually greater than the energy that is released when I form those new interactions. My overall enthalpy of solution is actually going to be greater than zero. In this case, I need to put in energy for this reaction to occur. So my delta H of solution is going to be a positive value. So in this case, my interactions are not dominant, and this reaction is not a favorable reaction. So how does one pick the right solvent when you're trying to form a solution? Well, that's easy because we're going to need to talk about intermolecular forces. And typically, to have an exothermic reaction, a favorable reaction, my two substances should have very similar intermolecular forces, meaning my solvent and my solute should have similar forces. So the sort of a general rule of solubility is likes dissolve likes. So if I have similar intermolecular forces between my solute and similar intermolecular forces between my solvent, they tend to dissolve in each other. Sort of a simplest, simple way to look at that is that nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes, and polar solvents typically dissolve polar solutes and many ionic compounds. Here are some examples. If I take water, which is a polar solvent, and I try to dissolve nonpolar oil in it, they're immiscible in each other or insoluble in each other, and they do not mix. If I take a polar water and something like polar alcohol, they tend to be miscible in each other, and they form a solution. In other words, I can surround that whole alcohol molecule. In this case, this would be isopropyl alcohol. I can surround it with my solvent water, so they're soluble in each other. If I now take a nonpolar substance like oil again, and I polar, pour it into a nonpolar solvent like this tetrachloroethylene, which is a nonpolar material, I can surround all my nonpolar oil with nonpolar solvent, and they tend to be miscible in each other. In this section, we're going to talk about aqueous solutions that conduct electricity. In order to conduct electricity, my solute that I add to water must have ions involved with it. And those are called electrolytes. And we'll discuss those in this section of chapter 11. Let's now look at a special solution where when the solute is dissolved in water, it tends to give a solution that conducts an electrical current, as shown here in this diagram of two electrodes in a light bulb connected with a wire, and also represented here in this diagram, where the solute, when dissolved in water, tends to move toward the electrodes. In this case, I have positive cations moving toward the negative anode, and I have negative anions moving toward the positive cathode. This is called an electrical current. It creates a circuit. 
That solute we call an electrolyte. When electrolytes are dissolved in water, they completely dissociate. In other words, they break up into the ionic forms, forming a solution that conducts electricity. There are two types of electrolytes that are very common. One are ionic compounds. In other words, there's a positive and negative ions that are formed, and they separate when they're put into solution. And they're free to move, making it possible for an electric current to pass through the solution. So these ions here are free to move in the water solution, and they move toward the appropriate electrode. A second type of electrolyte is a polar covalent molecules. In other words, they are not ionic, but they're very strong acids. Examples of ionic compounds are potassium bromide, sodium chloride, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. Examples of strong acids that are electrolytes are hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, perchloric acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. If my solute does not form ions, we tend to call that solute a non-electrite. So that's a substance that when dissolved in water, it gives a solution that does not conduct electricity. So when non-electrites are dissolved in solution, they do not dissociate into ions, but they literally just break up into molecules. For example, things like sugar. Sugar would just break up into individual molecules. It would be solvated by water, but I do not have any ions, so I do not conduct electricity. In other words, my solute molecules are neutral, and they do not contain mobile charge particles, so they cannot conduct electricity. So if I have a circuit again, and in this case, I hook up a battery to the black wire and the red wire, my light bulb actually does not light up because I do not complete the circuit between the two electrodes here. My negative electrode and my positive electrode, I don't have any charge carriers here, so my circuit is not completed. Other examples of molecular compounds that are non-electrolytes would be water itself. Water is not an ionic compound. It does not conduct electricity. Methanol, ethanol, tetrachloromethane, those are all considered molecular compounds. Now you might have noticed that people talk about water being an electrical conductor. That's because a lot of water contains ions. When you take tap water out of the faucet, there are a lot of dissolved ions in it, sodium and chlorine, all types of elements. It's those electrolytes that are conducting the electricity, not the water. Water is our solvent in that case. Some electrolytes are better at actually forming a circuit than the others. So we often associate a strength of an electrolyte to its ability to actually form ionic compounds, ionic species. So for example, if I were to take a sucrose solution, that is actually an extremely poor electrolyte. In fact, we call that a non-electrolyte, so it does not conduct electricity. If we look at acetic acid, that's a weak acid. It has some ionic character to it, so it actually conducts a little bit of electricity. Then when I get to sodium chloride, it's a better electrolyte, so I have fairly good electrical conduction through my solution. But if I put in a very strong acid, it's the best electrolyte, and I get good conductivity through my solution because I have multiple ions now. I have my hydronium ion and I have my chloride ion to actually conduct electricity. Let's look at the chemical and physical characteristics of a electrolyte, which we would consider to be a strong electrolyte. Strong electrolytes, they typically completely dissociate into ions. In other words, they produce 100% ions, and they conduct electricity. So for example, sodium chloride, calcium bromide, and hydrochloric 
acid, they completely dissociate in aqueous water. They form 100% ions, so those are considered strong electrolytes. If we look at solutes that actually are weak electrolytes, which means they mostly dissolve in water, but they produce just a few ions. For example, if I take acetic acid, common ingredients in vinegar, and I put that in water, some of the molecules dissociate into ions, and that conducts electricity. But this is an equilibrium reaction in this case, so I still have this neutral non-ionic compound, compound in water, so we consider this a weak electrolyte. The same is true for hydrofluoric acid, that's not a strong acid, or if I look at ammonia, that is actually a weak base. So some of those compounds dissociate into ions, so I get some conductivity across the solution, but it's very minimal. And finally, non-electrolytes. Things that dissolve in water but that do not produce ions and therefore they do not conduct electricity or form a current. An example of that would be something like sugar water. I take sugar, sucrose, I put it in water, I, it dissolves completely but no ions are formed. Sucrose is considered a non-electrolyte. In this section, we're going to talk about measuring the concentration of a solution. And the major way we do that in chemistry is molarity. So we'll start off with molarity, and then we'll look at a few other ways to measure concentrations. A solution is a term for a homogeneous mixture, in other words, two or more compounds that are completely mixed together into homogeneous mixture. A solution has a uniform composition and properties throughout its entire volume. And a solution consists of two components. One is the solvent. That's the component where the concentration is significantly greater than any of the other components of my mixture. And secondly is the solute. That is typically the component that is present in much lower concentration than the solvent. An example, if I take some copper sulfate and dissolve it in water, the water is my solvent, the copper sulfate is my solute. A note here is that a solution in which water is the solvent is always called an aqueous solution. And we often put this suffix behind the molecular formula, in other words, aq in parentheses, to note that it is an aqueous solution of copper sulfate. Chemists would like to know how much copper sulfate is in the aqueous solution. And that's what we're going to discuss next, calculating the concentration of that solution. One way to find out the composition of a solution is to know the relative amounts of the components in a solution. We call this the concentration, and it is defined as the amount of solute dissolved in the total amount of solution. There are many different units for this concentration, but chemists most often like to use the units of molarity. Molarity units are the moles of solute in exactly one liter of solution. From previous work, we know how to calculate the number of moles right now, especially since we know the relationship between Avogadro's number and moles. So the units for moles is molarity. Molarity is equal to the moles of solute divided by the liters of solution. Let's do a practice calculation. If I have 0.2 moles of copper sulfate and I add just enough water to make one liter of solution, as shown here in this volumetric flask, I put those numbers into my equation. I have 0.2 moles of copper sulfate in one liter of solution. 
That is a 0 0.2 molar solution that I've just made. Let's do a few more examples where my volume is not exactly one liter. Let's say I have a 300 milliliter sample and I put 0.2 moles of copper sulfate in it, what is my concentration? What is my molar concentration? Again, just use this formula. I have 0.2 moles of copper sulfate and 300 milliliters of water. I convert my units into liters by multiplying times 1,000. I then get equation is 0.667 molar copper sulfate, molar, the units are moles per liter, and that's the only, only units that I'm left with now because my milliliter units cancel out. Let's do a third example here. I have 200 milliliters that contains 0.133 moles of sucrose. Go about it in the exact same way. Take our formula for molarity moles of solute per liters of solution. I have 0.133 moles of sucrose in 200 milliliters. Get the units to work out. So I multiply by the conversion factor of 1,000 milliliters per liter. I get 0.665 molar sucrose, moles of solute per liter of solution. Let's now look at an example where I first start with grams of some compound. I'm going to start with 15 grams of sodium chloride, and I'm going to add enough water to reach 500 milliliters of solution, as, il as is illustrated over here in this graduated cylinder. So molar concentration, I need to know how many moles of sodium chloride I have first, so let's do that calculation. I know I have 15 grams of sodium chloride. I'm going to multiply it times my conversion factor of 58.44 grams of sodium chloride per mole of sodium chloride. Again, this number here was actually first calculated by taking the molar mass of sodium and adding it to the molar mass of chlorine to get 58.44. Doing the arithmetic, I get 0. 2567 moles of sodium chloride. I'm then going to put that into my equation for molarity. I got moles of solute to, to liters of solution. I have 0 0.236 moles of sodium chloride. I add 500 milliliters of solution. I correct the units using the following conversion factor to get 0 0.5133 molar sodium chloride solution. In practice, if I needed to make a solution with a very accurately known concentration or molarity, I would typically use a volumetric flask instead of a graduated cylinder, and I'd follow the following methodology. I would first weigh out my solute very accurately on a balance. I'd place it into that volumetric flask and then it add a little bit of water and then start swirling it to dissolve all my solute completely. And then I would finally add enough solvent to bring the volume up to a mark on my volumetric flask and then shake it up again. When preparing solutions in the laboratory, dilution is a common methodology for preparing multiple solutions with different concentrations. So dilution is a process whereby the concentration of the solution is lessened by adding more solvent. By adding solvent to a solution, one can produce a solution with lower concentration. Let's look at an example here. If I have a solution, I have one milliliter of it, and it has a concentration of 0 0.10 moles per liter, if I add one milliliter of solvent to that solution, I've diluted it, and you can see here it looks a little less purple. 
if I add three milliliters more to that beaker, I now even have a more dilute solution. But what are those concentrations and can we calculate them? Sure we can. Concentration in chemistry is often reported in moles per liter, molarity. I can simplify this equation a little bit by substituting N in for moles because N is typically used in chemistry to indicate the number of moles. So I'm going to set molarity now is equal to N divided by liters. I can also simplify that by substituting L in for liters to just get the simple equation molarity equals N divided by L, but that's not simple enough. I'm going to put the capital M capital M in chemistry stands for molarity, which is equal to N, the number of moles, divided by the volume in liters, capital L. So let's look at our example here. I start off with M, which is equal to 0.1 moles per liter. Let's calculate the number of moles in that liter right there. So, I use my equation, I rearrange this last equation a little bit. I have 0 0.10 molar solution. I multiply that times my volume in liters, which is 0 0.001 liters. I get 0 0.0001 moles. Let's now add approximately one milliliter of solvent to that solution, okay? So I know that the, my number of moles has not changed. I've just added water, the number of moles of my solute specifically. So now I can calculate my new concentration. I just rearrange my equation again because my molarity is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume. I know the number of moles divided by the new volume. That equals 0 0.05 molar. And how about for this final one here? I know my concentration of moles, my solute has not changed. I've just added more solvent to that. So I can use this same equation again. I got my number of moles in there divided by my volume in liters. I got 0 0.0001 moles divided by 0 0.005 liters. I got a 0 0.02 molar solution. In other words, dilution does not change the amount of sol solute if I'm just adding solvent to my solution. Let's now take another look at that equation for determining the amount of solute in solution, and we'll add to it. The molar amount of solute, N, which is just the number of moles of solute, in a solution can be calculated by taking the concentration in moles per liter, multiplying it times the volume in liters. Okay. Expressions now can be written for the solution before dilution and after solution. Let's call the solution before one and the solution after two. So if I wanna calculate the molar amount of solute before dilution, I just take the concentration times the volume. If I want to know the amount of solute after dilution, I multiply the molar concentration now times the volume of my solution. Since the dilution process does not change the amount of solute, which we saw in the previous example, n sub 1 must equal n sub 2, so we can actually set m sub 1 times L sub 1 equal to M sub 2 times L sub 2 in the following equation. So I have moles per liter times liter equals moles per liter after dilution times liters after dilution. Often other units are used too. 
I can use this, just change the unit, so I could use any units of concentration times any units of volume can be used. And this is actually considered the dilution equation. Let's use that dilution equation to actually calculate some concentrations after dilution. So if I have 0.85 liters of a 5 molar solution of copper nitrate, and I dilute it to a volume of 1.80 liters, what is the new concentration? And specifically, let's use molarity to measure that concentration. Let's first write down what we know. I know that my V1 is equal to 0.85, C1 is equal to 5.0 molar, that's before dilution. After dilution, I now have 1.8 liters, I just need to solve for C2. So I take my dilution equation and I just rearrange it to I solve for C2 and then start and plugging in numbers. So for C1, I plug in 5.00 molar. For V1, I plug in 0 0.850 liters. For V2, I plug in 1.80 liters. I come up with 2.36 molar copper nitrate solution. Let's do a second example. Let's say we have 0.5 liters of a 6 molar solution of copper nitrate and we would like to make a 2.00 molar solution. I want to know how much water I need to add. So let's write down what I know. I know that before dilution my volume is equal to 0.5 liters. Before dilution I have a 6 molar solution. We're going to solve for my final volume, D2, and I know my final concentration is 2.00 molar. So let's just take the dilution equation and rearrange it so that I'm solving for V sub 2, which is my final volume. Let's plug in those numbers. I have 6 molar times 0 0.500 liters divided by 2 molar. My final volume is going to be 1.50 liters. This is the final volume. This isn't how much water I have to add. I need to add some water to my 0.5 liters to get 1.5 liters, and I can simply do that by just subtracting the volumes. My final volume minus my initial volume equals one liter, so I need to add one liter of my solvent to get up to 1.5 liters. The dilution equation is also very useful when I want to make serial dilutions. In other words, I'm diluting a solution more than once. My final goal is to do a calculation for how, what is the concentration in each of these beakers. So here I'm starting out in beaker number one with 250 milliliters of a 5.00 molar solution. So I know the concentration here. I'm going to take 125 milliliters of that solution and put it into a second beaker. Have I changed the concentration? No. I just have a smaller volume. So I now I only have 125 milliliters of that same 5.00 molar solution. I haven't diluted it. But if I add 125 milliliters of water now to beaker number two, I have diluted that solution, and we can use the dilution equation to actually do that calculation. Let's write down what we have. I have 125 milliliters that I started with. I have a concentration of 5.00 molars that I started with. I have a new volume in beaker 3 of 250 milliliters. Let's use the dilution equation. I solve for C sub 3. I get 2.50 moles here, molar solution. Let's do another dilution. 
Let's take 75 milliliters out of beaker 3 and put it in beaker 4. What's my concentration now? It's still the same as it was in beaker 3. I just have 75 milliliters of it. If I now want to do a dilution, I'm going to add 175 milliliters of water. I now need the dilution equation. V4 now is the same as it was before. That's before dilution. C4 is the same as it was before. My new volume is 250 milliliters. I'm just going to now solve using the dilution equation for my final volume. Do the mathematics. I get 0.2. 0.75 molar solution. Notice I went from 5 moles to 2.5 moles down to 0.75 molar solution. That is my dilution. In practice, I would probably use a volumetric flask. I would transfer over a known amount of my concentrated solution, maybe using a pipette. I would then add some water to my volumetric flask and mix it up. And then I would add water up to the calibration mark and then I would mix it up again. Hopefully the methodology in doing dilutions is apparent, but let's do a few more exercises to make sure. Sulfuric acid is normally purchased at a concentration of 18.0 molar. How would you prepare a 250 milliliter solution at a 0 0.500 molar concentration? Well, let's first write down what we know. We need to know how much of the concentrated solution to use. That would be V1, and that's what we're going to solve for. I know the concentration that we start with. I know that when I've diluted the sample, I want 250 milliliters, and I know I want a concentration of 0 0.250 molar solution. Let's just rearrange the dilution equation and solve for V sub 1. So I start off, and I take 0 0.250 molar times 250 milliliters, divide that by my 18 molar solution, and I get 6.94 milliliters that I need to add and then dilute that up to 250 milliliters. So I take 6.94 milliliters of my 18 molar solution. I take a 250 milliliter volumetric flask and then I add enough water to make 250.0 milliliters. Let's do one final example. Hydrochloric acid is often purchased at a concentration of 1.000 molar, so we know the concentration very accurately. How would we prepare 500 milliliters of a 0 0.500 molar aqueous solution? Let's first write down what we know. I know the concentration I'm starting off with. I know the final volume we want. I know the concentration of that I want in in the final dilution. We rearrange the dilution equation to solve for V sub 1. I plug in all my values for that. I get a value of 250 milliliters that I need. And I then have to take that 250 milliliters of my 1.0 molar HCl solution, add it to a 500 milliliter volumetric flask and then add enough water to make my final volume of 500 milliliters. There are a few other units that are often used for concentration in chemistry. One of them is mass percentage. That is actually defined as the ratio of the components mass that we're looking at divided by the total solution mass and then expressed as a percentage. So I take a mass of one of the components, I divide it by the mass of the whole solution, and then I multiply it times 100%. An example of that would be liquid bleach, and it is an aqueous solution of sodium hypochlorite. And in this brand, its concentration of sodium hypochlorite 
is actually reported as a mass percentage. So in this bleach solution, I have 7.4% sodium chloride by mass. A unit of concentration that is also used in chemistry is volume percentage. And this is often used when I'm mixing two liquids together. So I take a liquid solute and a liquid solvent and then multiply times 100%. So I take the volume of solute and then I take the volume of the final solution, multiply it times 100%. Antifreeze is a consumer product that uses its volume percent to report its concentration. So this brand reports 50% by volume of ethylene glycol. A third unit of concentration that is used in chemistry is the mass to volume ratio where I literally just take the mass of the solute divided by the volume of solution. When we measure the concentration of glucose levels in blood, we use this measure of concentration. So when I have a device to measure my glucose level, it's measuring it in milligrams per deciliter of solution. Mass of solute divided by volume of solute. A fourth measure of concentration is mass to volume percentage. Here I take the mass of the solute divided by the volume of solute and then just multiply by 100%. Mass to volume percent units are commonly encountered in medical settings and one of them is in my glucose concentration or saline concentration used in IVs. So in a saline solution, I usually have a 0.9% mass to volume ratio, indicating that my composition is 0.9 grams per 100 milliliters of solution. And finally, if I have very, very low concentrations that I need to report, I use the units of parts per million or parts per billion. And these are often used when reporting contaminants in things like in water or in the atmosphere. So parts per million is the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 10 to the 6 and that gets me to the million mark. Parts per billion is actually the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 10 to the 9th. Let's now look at how temperature and pressure can have an effect on solubility. Solubility is actually an equilibrium reaction on its own. If I take the solute and solvent and I dissolve the solute in the solvent, I form a solution. However, there's also a reverse reaction where I could recrystallize out of solution to form my solute in my solute again. An example of that is either a saturated solution or a supersaturated solution. For example, if I take salt and I pour it into water, eventually I reach so high a concentration of salt that it no longer actually dissolves in water. I've actually come to an equilibrium state where my dissolving and my recrystallization are actually in equilibrium with, with each other and I have now undissolved solute in my water. So a saturated solution can be defined as a solution containing the maximum possible amount of dissolved solute at an equilibrium. In some cases, I can actually add a little bit more, and we call this a supersaturated solution, and define that as a solution that contains a greater than equilibrium amount of solute. So an example of that would again be something like sodium acetate in water. I can keep on adding sodium acetate to 
actually overcome that equilibrium because I don't disturb it. If I finally just disturb that whole equilibrium by changing the nature of how those atoms are oriented, I could actually recrystallize out and I actually favor in that case the solute over the solvent. So we have two different terms here, supersaturated and saturated solutions. Let's look at the solubilities as they're affected by both temperature and pressure. We're going to talk about the effect of temperature on solubility by looking at two cases. One is going to be where I solute is air dissolved in water and the other is where we have a solid dissolved in water. So small bubbles of air in this glass of chilled water tend to form when the water is warmed at room temperature. That's because we're actually changing the solubility of the dissolved air in water. So if I look at pure glass of water, I heat it up a little bit, I start to form bubbles on the edges here. That's because I'm now changing the solubility. The air is not as soluble anymore in the water. If we look at a solid in water, we're going to use the example of a sugar cube here. I take a sugar cube, I throw it in cold water. After a long period of time, I still see the sugar cube in there. If instead now I take some hot water near boiling and I throw in a sugar cube, that sugar cube starts to dissolve immediately. And after a short period of time, I wouldn't see that sugar cube at all. In other words, I formed a nice homogeneous solution by using hot water instead of cold water. Let's actually look at a graph where we look at the solubility in grams per 100 milliliters in water versus temperature. So let's first look at glucose. If I look at glucose, as I increase the temperature, my solubility increases. So if I take a sugar cube and I throw it in water, and it, if it doesn't dissolve at cold, temp, cold water, I can actually just heat my water up and it will dissolve. If I look at salt sodium chloride, in this case, my solubility does not change with temperature. So if I actually reach a saturated solution and I heat that up, I do not change the solubility at all. Heating the water does not affect the solubility. If I look at a bunch of other substances, you can sort of see here that it's sort of a complex nature and there's no general trend. If I raise the temperature, in some cases, they become more soluble. In other cases, like sodium chloride, they're not does not change the solubility at all. If I look at cesium sulfate, I actually decrease the solubility. So this is the case of solubility of a solid in an aqueous solution. In other words, the bottom line, it's complex and it's not linear. Let's look at an example where I want to dissolve potassium bromide in water. I'm going to be at 40 degrees C. Somebody has gone and measured the solubility of potassium bromide at 40 degrees, and they've determined that its solubility is 80 grams per 100 grams of water. So let's look at three other cases. Let's identify whether the following solutions are saturated or unsaturated. So let's say I take 60 grams of potassium bromide and I add it to 100 grams of water and I stir it up and I wait a little while. Is that solution going to be saturated or unsaturated? If it's unsaturated, I can add some more potassium bromide and it will actually dissolve. It is if it is saturated, if I add more potassium bromide, it will not dissolve. So in this case, I just do the quick mathematics. I have 60 grams per 100 grams. That's an unsaturated solution. I could add literally 20 more grams of potassium bromide to make up 100 grams. How about if I added 200 grams of potassium bromide to 100 grams of water at 40 degrees? Well, just put that into my solubility where I have 100 grams in my denominator here. I have 100 grams 
in 100 grams. In fact, that's going to be a saturated solution, and I will most likely see a solid down at the bottom that is not dissolved. How about my third example here, where I take 25 grams of potassium bromide, and I add it to 50 grams of water at 100 degrees C. I just need to get everything into my solubility units here of a something grams per 100 grams of water. Do the quick mathematics, I find out that I have 50 grams of water for every 100 grams. This is also going to be an unsaturated solution. I could add literally more potassium bromide to my 50 grams of water. Now let's look at the solubility of gases in liquids. If I look at this example here, and let's look at CO2, because that's a common gas that is actually put into water, for example, in sodas. So if I look at room temperature, which is about 20 to 25 degrees C, you can see my solubility of CO2 in water is very high. As I increase the temperature, my solubility tends to become lower and lower. So one reason to keep a open can of soda cold is to keep the CO2 in solution because it's going to be soluble in solution. If I heat that solution up, I tend to make it sort of a flat soda now because my CO2 is no longer as soluble. The same thing is true here with xenon, nitrogen, oxygen. But again, this behavior is kind of complex and it depends on what type of gas I have. When I have a gas dissolved in liquid, I'm actually going to have some of the gas at the surface is actually going to leave. And if I'm in a sealed container, I will eventually reach an equilibrium between the pressure of the gas and the amount of gas being redissolved. We call that the partial pressure, as we have seen in the previous chapters here. We can actually calculate the gas solubility by using a constant, it on, and it depends on the type of gas liquid concentration, and measuring the partial pressure of the gas. So at equilibrium, I have gases being released from my liquid and being redissolved. If I increase the pressure, I can actually, by pushing down in this example, on a pressure, more gas is actually temporarily forced into solution until a new equilibrium is restored. And I can measure that by using partial pressures here. If one goes to the grocery store or gas station and buys a can of carbonated beverage, that can is actually sealed under high pressure. When I open that can, I actually reduce the pressure of the gaseous CO2 just above the liquid level. In other words, I change the solubility of the CO2 in the water. In this case, it's lowered dramatically as I open that can. And some of the dissolved CO2 is actually seen leaving the solution as bubbles. Either violently if my can has been shaken and I have high, high pressure inside my can, or gradually if I open it carefully. When I open it carefully and let that open can of Coca-Cola sit on the table for a period of time, eventually the solubility of my CO2 is actually so low that eventually my CO2 will leave that can completely and my beverage will no longer be a carbonated beverage. I'll have a flat soda. Many properties of solutions depend on what the solute is and what the solvent is. However, there are four properties that are independent of what the solute is. It just depends on how much solute put it, you put in, and those are vapor pressure, boiling point, freezing point, and osmotic pressure. When one makes a solution by dissolving a solute in a pure solvent, you would expect the properties of that solution to be different than that of the pure solvent. And most of the time they are. 
There are some properties, however, that are independent of what type of solute you add and only dependent on how much you add. We call those properties colligative properties. And the definition would be properties that depend only on the m amount of dissolved solute and not on the solute's chemical identity. So if by adding a solute to a solvent, there are four different colligative, colligative properties that we talk about in this section of chapter 11. That's vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. When we think of vapor pressure lowering and boiling point elevation, we can actually experience that in our kitchens where we literally add salt to water to raise the boiling point or lower the vapor pressure. Or if you're an ice cream enthusiast and you make your own ice cream, we add salt to the water around the container to lower the freezing point so that we get colder ice cream. And finally, osmotic pressure. That's how we carry liquids and oxygen around in our bodies through the red blood cells where we generate a pressure, so we have blood pressure. Let's start off our discussion on colligative properties by discussing vapor pressure lowering. So what is vapor pressure? If we place the liquid in a closed container, we will be vaporizing some of that liquid into the gas phase and we will be condensing some of the gas down into the liquid phase. When we reach an equilibrium, we have an equal amount of liquid turning into gas and an equal amount of gas going back into the liquid. So if I look at this graphic down here, I have liquid molecules there being vaporized into the gas phase and I have vapor molecules, gas, being condensed back onto the liquid phase. These molecules that are in the gas phase, they actually bump into the walls of the container and we know that that exerts a pressure on that container and we could hook up a manometer and actually measure that pressure. So the vapor pressure of a liquid is the pressure exerted by the gas molecules when the liquid and the gas are in equilibrium. Another way to look at that is down in this graphic here, where I have pure solvent down here, I have a sealed container, I have some gas molecules that have been vaporized, they bump into the container again and exert a pressure. Let's now add some solute to my liquid. So my solid molecules actually reduce the surface area at the top of the liquid here. So I have fewer molecules that can be actually vaporized. That our, however, has to assume that my solute is not going to be volatile, so it's a solid and dissolved in solution. So what that has is an effect on the vaporization rate. The rate of vaporization decreases the rate of solvent condensation remains the same. So if I look at this graphic over here, I have fewer molecules going into the vapor phase, but I have the same amount still going down, condensing back into the solute, because only the volatile solvent molecules can be vaporized. So the presence of non-volatile solutes, like these green spheres right here, or these blue ones in this picture over here, it lowers the vapor pressure by impeding the evaporation rate of the solvent molecules. That's how we can actually sort of describe vapor pressure lowering, by adding a non-volatile solute to a solvent. Raoult actually came up with a relationship between the partial pressure of a gas and how much solute is actually added. So what his relation is, is that the partial pressure of the solution is equal to the initial partial pressure of the pure solvent, that's what this little superscript zero means, pure, times the mole fraction of the solvent. So what is the mole fraction? We've talked about molarity, that's just the moles of solute by, divided by the liters of solution. The mole fraction of a solvent is actually equal to the moles of the solvent 
divided by the moles of the solvent plus the moles of the solute. So that's how we're defining that. And we're going to use this mole fraction when calculating the partial pressures of a solution using mole fraction here. Let's now look at Raut's law in graphical form. Here's his law again. The partial pressure of the solution is equal to the partial pressure of the pure solvent times the mole fraction of the solvent. In this diagram here on the left, I have a sealed container with a liquid in it. I wait until I actually reached an equilibrium of evaporation and condensation, and then I measure the pressure using a manometer. And this graphic just shows sort of a relative pressure here on this red line here. If I add some solute to my liquid, as shown here by these red spheres right here, these are non-volatile solute molecules or atoms. If I then wait and I measure the pressure again, I see that my vapor pressure is lower. So in other words, the pressure of my solvent is greater than the pressure of my solution. And that's Raoult's law. And it's related to the mole fraction of the solvent. Let's now apply Raoult's law to show how much the vapor pressure is lowered of a water solution when we add some glucose to it. So the vapor pressure of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is 23.76 millimeters of mercury. I want to know the vapor pressure of a solution that is made when I add 1.00 moles of glucose to 15.0 moles of water at 25 degrees C. A few criteria are is that the solute, in this case glucose, must be a non-volatile solute. And my solvent, as shown down here, must be a volatile solvent, like water is. So here's Raoult's law where the pressure of my solution is equal to the pressure of my solvent times the mole fraction of my solvent. So the vapor pressure of my pure solvent water is 23.76 millimeters of mercury. My mole fraction is I take the number of moles of my water divided by the total number of moles of all the molecules that are in my solution. So the moles of glucose and the moles of water, do the mathematics, and I get 22.3 millimeters of mercury. In other words, I've lowered the vapor pressure from 23.76 to 22.3 millimeters of mercury by adding some glucose to the solution. We can look at this diagram here to get a physical picture of that process. If I look at pure water in a sealed container, molecules that are liquid tend to leave the surface and become gas phase molecules. And gas phase molecules, water in this case, will also enter in through the surface of my liquid and go back into the liquid phase. If I wait long enough, these will become a dynamic equilibrium. And that is responsible for the vapor pressure of that liquid. If I add some glucose now, you can see that some of the glucose molecules take up space on the surface. In other words, there's not as much room for the water molecules to go from the liquid to the gas phase or to go from the gas phase back into the liquid phase. So if I wait long enough, a new equilibrium is built up. But because there's less surface area now, the amount of molecules creating pressure is lower. Therefore, my vapor pressure is lower. We have seen that the partial pressure, based on Raoult's law, is a colligative property that is directly proportional to the concentration of the solute particles. It doesn't matter what those particles are. For example, by dissolving one mole of glucose, C6H12O6, which is a non-electrolyte, that results in one mole of solute particles in my solution. However, if I dissolve an electrolyte, like sodium chloride, 
for example, I take one mole of sodium chloride in and dissolve it in water, I actually get two moles of solute particles because I get sodium cations and chlorine anions. I get two particles in my solution now, and we need to correct for that. The Van Hoff factor, which we're going to call this little small italics I here, is the ratio of solute particles in solution to the number of formula units in solution. So for example, for sodium chloride, that I is going to be 2. So I take sodium chloride, I dissolve it in water, I get 2 moles of my ions or particles in water. If I take my glucose, I take glucose, dissolve it in water, I get 1 mole. If I take calcium chloride, I take one mole of calcium chloride, dissolve it in water, I get one mole of calcium and two moles of chlorine for three particles, or three moles of particles in my water. And as another example, sodium phosphate, if I dissolve that in water, I get three moles of sodium and one mole of phosphate for a total of two moles of particles in my water. So you can see we need to correct Raoult's law depending on which type of solute we use, whether it is an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte, but we're still thinking only these colligative properties depend on the number of particles in solution, not what they are. So let's look at that Van't Hoff factor this italics I, that's the moles of particles in solution divided by the moles of solute in solution. For example, if I put a mole of sodium chloride, I'd have two moles of particles in solution. If I took one mole of glucose, I'd have one mole of particles in solution. So we need to include this correction factor in all colligative properties and equations, even beyond our partial pressures. So here's Raoult's law again. We're now going to correct my mole fraction using the Van Hoff factor. So my mole fraction in this case is still my moles of solvent divided by my moles of solvent plus my moles of solute, how much particles I've added, times that Van Hoff factor, which is going to be like a 1 or a 2 or a 3 or a 4. If I go into the laboratory and I actually measure the Van Hoff factor for strong electrolytes, it turns out that my experimentally measured values are slightly lower than predicted. For example, for sodium chloride, we would predict a Van Hoff factor of 2. That's because 1 mole of sodium chloride gives me a mole of sodium and a mole of chlorine for 2 moles of particles in solution. However, if I do the experiments, my experimental value for the Van Hoff factor is actually 1.9. Okay? And what that implies is that there is some incomplete dissociation. Not all of my sodium chloride actually dissociates into two particles. Let's look at some other Van Hoff factors, what we predict and what we actually measure. So if I take glucose, I would predict a Van Hoff Van Hoff factor of 1, and I go into the laboratory and I measure it at 1. Sodium chloride, I predict 2, and I measure 1.9. HCl, I would also predict 2 because it's a strong electrolyte, and I measure 1.9. If I look at the strong electrolyte magnesium sulfate, I would predict 2, but I actually measure 1.3. Magnesium chloride, predict 3, get 2.7. Ferric chloride, predict 4, I actually measure 3.4. So the Van Hoff factor is not perfect. However, we can actually rationalize that again by incomplete dissociation. And let's look at that. So what, that, what does that mean? The explanation for incomplete dissociation comes from the formation of cation-anion pairs. For example, if I put potassium chloride in water, potassium chloride is a strong electrolyte. It should dissociate into potassium and chloride. But because the potassium has a positive charge and the chlorine has a negative charge, they can actually pair up 
most of them are actually just separate ions in solution, like this chlorine, potassium, potassium chlorine. There are a few that pair up. These act as one particle, so they've paired up. So the effective concentration of my particles is known as activity is less than the predicted concentration of the ions in solution. Dissociation of ionic compounds is always not complete just due to this formation of these ion pairs, which accounts for my slightly lower vent Hoff factor than predicted. If I were to take a solution and add a solute to it and then measure the boiling point or the freezing point, those are also affected by the solute concentration. In this case, a solution boils at a higher temperature than that of the pure solvent. So if I add a solute to a liquid and I measure the boiling point, it boils at a high temperature. The difference in boiling point of the solution versus that pure solvent is called the boiling point elevation temperature, or delta T sub B. A solution actually freezes at a lower temperature than that of the pure solvent. So the difference in freezing point between a solution, in which I've added a solute, and the pure solvent is called the freezing point depression, or delta T sub F. For non-electrolytes, those that do not associate, there is a relationship. Though so that amount of temperature increase is equal to a constant, which is based on the solvent, times the molality of the solution. If I look at solutions made with electrolytes, I need to include the Van't Hoff factor because I know that they dissociate into more ions than moles of material. In that case, my difference in boiling point temperature is again going to be equal to some constant based on the solution times the molality times the Van't Hoff factor. The freezing point depression, that change in temperature, is going to be equal to minus a constant based on the solvent times the molality. And for electrolytic solutes, those are going to be equal to minus another constant times the molality times the Van't Hoff factor. Let's look at a table which actually gives us the boiling point constant and the freezing point constant for a variety of common solvents. For example, if I look on this table, benzene has a boiling point, point constant of 2.6 and a freezing point constant of 5.07. For all of these, these happen to be organic solvents. A lot of the chemistry that we do is actually based on water. So the boiling point constant for water is 0 0.51, and the freezing point constant is 1.86. Let's work out another sample problem. In this example, what is the freezing point in degree C of a solution prepared by dissolving 7.0 grams of magnesium chloride in 110 grams of water. There's a few things I need to know. I need to know the freezing point constant of water, and I went and just looked that up in a table. I need to know the Van't Hoff factor. I could estimate it to be three, but I'm also going to go look that up in the table to be more accurate. It turns out in this case, the Van't Hoff factor is 2.7. So the first thing I need to do is get all my units into moles here. So I'm going to take my 7 grams of magnesium chloride, convert that to moles by using the molecular weight of magnesium chloride. I have 0 0.077 moles. I then need to calculate the molality, my small m. Okay, So that's going to be the moles of my solute in kilograms, per kilogram. So I just take that, I have 0 0.0076 moles. I'm going to put that in a 110 grams of water. I'm going to convert that to kilograms of water. So in this case, my molality is 0 0.71 moles per kilogram. And then I can put it into the, my freezing point depression equation. 
So delta T, the change in temperature, is going to be equal to my constant, minus 1.86, times my molality, times my von Hoff factor. I do the arithmetic. That's equal to minus 3.6 degrees. Remember that that's just the change in temperature. I still need to actually go back and figure out what the temperature now is for water. My freezing point for water is 0 degrees. And once I've added my solute, it's going to be 3.6 degrees less. So I've got to do a little arithmetic. My temperature for freezing now is going to be minus 3.6 degrees C. Let's do another example. What is the freezing point in degree C of a solution prepared by dissolving 17.1 grams of sucrose in 200 grams of water? What's the freezing point of pure water again? That would be 0 degrees. So we're going to calculate the change in temperature. If I look at the Vont Hoff factor for sucrose, it is equal to 1. And again, my Freezing point constant is minus 1.86 degrees C kilograms per mole. I'm going to calculate how many moles of sucrose I have. So I take my grams of sucrose divided by my molecular weight of sucrose. I get 0 0.0500 moles of sucrose. I now need to calculate the molality of my solution. That's my moles of solute divided by my grams of water. I'm going to convert that into kilograms because the de definition of molality is moles per kilogram. I end up with 0 0.250 moles per kilogram of solute. Put that back into my freezing point depression equation. Minus 1.86 times 0 0.25 times my Van Hoff factor. I get minus 0 0.465 degrees C. I need to subtract that from my original freezing point of water, so it's 0 minus 0.465. My freezing point of water now is minus 0 0.465 degrees Celsius. Let's look at an example where we actually calculate the boiling point elevation. So what is the boiling point, again, in degrees Celsius, of a solution prepared by dissolving 20.1 grams of a non-electrolyte? That tells me something. Well, if I have a non-electrolyte, I can actually assume my Van Hoff factor is actually 1. We're going to dissolve that non-electrolyte in 400 grams of water. This material has a boiling point constant of 0.51 kilograms per mole and a molar mass of 62.0 grams per mole. So I need to know the information so I can calculate the molality. So I take my 20.1 grams. I know my molecular mass. I calculate the number of moles of solute. I then calculate the molality of my solution, taking my moles of solute divided by my water, the multiplying times 1,000 grams per kilogram to get in the right units for molality. I have 0 0.810 moles per kilogram of solvent. I then put that into my boiling point elevation equation. And in this case, I got 0.51 times 0 0.810 times my Van Hoff factor of 1. I get 0 0.41 degrees. What's the normal boiling point of water? That's 100 degrees, so I need to add my difference onto that. That means I'm going to have now my water is going to boil at 100.41 degrees. How does one explain the fact that adding a solute to a solvent elevates the boiling point and lowers the freezing point? It turns out that boiling point, delta T sub B and freezing point delta T sub F are both directly re the result of vapor pressure lowering. For example, if we look at boiling points here, boiling occurs when the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. And we know that vapor pressure is directly proportional to temperature. We can look at that down here on this graphic down here. If I have a pure solvent, I actually have a partial pressure of my solvent. When I start heating that solvent up, at some point, my 
pre partial pressure of my solvent is going to equal the atmospheric pressure, and that's when boiling occurs. If I actually add some solute to my solvent, I know that the vapor pressure of that solution now is actually lower, so I've lowered the vapor pressure. I need a higher temperature now to actually equal the vapor, have the vapor pressure of my solution equal the atmospheric pressure. Therefore, my boiling point has increased. We can also explain freezing point depression and boiling point elevation using a phase diagram. So below here is a phase diagram where I've plotted pressure on the y-axis and I've plotted temperature on the x-axis. This red line here is actually the phase diagram for a pure solvent. So here's my, in this area here, I'm all solid. Here is the liquid phase, and here is the gas phase. If I were to add a solute to my liquid, I lower the vapor pressure, so I lower the pressure here. So this new green line here is actually the solution phase diagram because it's lower now. It has consequences, okay? So because my vapor pressure is lower here, I've shifted my boiling point to a higher temperature. So here is my boiling point of my pure solvent. Now that I've lowered the pressure, here is my boiling point now of my solution, where I have solute and solvent in my solution. So I've raised the boiling point. I also can look over here on the left-hand side of my diagram. As I lowered the pressure, I've also changed where my triple point occurs. So now if I look at this point right here, this is actually the point, is my freezing point here. But when I lower the vapor pressure by adding solvent, I also change the triple point here. So now my freezing point is actually lower. I have freezing point depression. A common example of freezing point depression, especially here in Alaska where it snows an awful lot, is actually by spreading sodium chloride and or calcium chloride on our roads, we actually lower the freezing point of that incoming snow so it stays liquid even at lower temperatures and that is due to freezing point depression. One factor that can affect the solubility of a solute in a solvent is osmosis. In the process of osmosis, we've added a third component to our system, and that is a semi-permeable membrane. Osmosis is defined as the passage of solvent through the semi-permeable membrane from the less concentrated side to the more concentrated side. A semi-permeable membrane is a material, often thin, that allows select molecules or ions to pass through that membrane. These are often determined by their size, by their shape, polarity, charge, or some other factor. An example of that is this line right down here, which represents a three-dimensional membrane, which contains holes in it. Those holes are of a certain size or certain polarity. In this case, they only let little small blue water molecules pass through that membrane. Whereas on the other side of the membrane, there's water over here also, but there's also sucrose molecules. They're too big to pass through that membrane. If we look at this example here of osmosis, again, this green line here represents a membrane that has holes in it. It's a semi permeable membrane. On one side, I have both solute molecules, low concentration, and water molecules, high concentration. If I look on the other side of the membrane, which divides up this beaker here, I have equal concentrations of solvent and solute. In other words, high concentration of solute. If I wait for a period of time, my water molecules tend to pass through that semi-permeable membrane. 
and I increase the amount of water over here on my right hand side. In other words, I'm less concentrated now than I was over here, but both sides now are equal concentrations of solute in solvent. This is the process of osmosis. If we look at life, this process of osmosis is very important. All our cells either contain a cell membrane, like in animals, or a cell wall, like in plants, and liquids need to pass through those membranes or cell walls through using the process of osmosis to selectively pass one molecule through that membrane or cell wall and keep out other molecules. An example of a semi-permeable membrane is the membranes around all of our cells in our body. An example of one cell is actually a red blood cell and it is a water permeable membrane so it tends to let water in and out of it. So if I look at a solution and we're going to call this a hypotonic solution, here I have a high concentration of solute inside my red blood cells, and I have a low concentration of sol solute in outside the red blood cells, so for example, in my bloodstream, the water tends to go into the blood cells and I tend to swell my red blood cells. If I go to another region of my body where I might have a high concentration of solute outside the blood cells and a low concentration in, the water will actually leave through that semi-permeable cell membrane and leave the cell. In this case, we have a hypertonic solution and my red blood cells tend to shrink and become sort of crinkled. What we'd like to have is an isotonic solution where the concentration inside my red blood cells is the same as that outside my blood cells. Notice Again, that my solute, these sort of blue particle particles here, cannot pass through that membrane between the inside of the red blood cell and the outside of the red blood cell. If we look at cell membranes, they are very complicated structures, but they do contain these holes in them. That's what makes them semi-permeable. So we can have things like water actually be transported out through that holes in the membrane and depending on the concentration inside the cell or outside the cell I can actually build up osmotic pressure. Let's look at a graphic example of osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is defined as the amount of pressure necessary to prevent net passage of a solvent due to osmosis. In other words passing through a semi-permeable membrane. So if I look at this U-tube here, on one side of my semi-permeable membrane, I have pure solvent. On the other side, I've actually added some solute to that solvent to make a solution. So over time, my water molecules will pass through that semi-permeable membrane, decreasing the concentration of my solute and building up pressure. And I can actually then just look at the levels here to actually measure that pressure. So we have a net transfer of solvent molecules to the solution side that will occur over time and that yields an osmotic pressure that equals the rate of transfer in both directions. So once I've reached equilibrium, meaning my solvent is going in one direction at the same rate I'm going in the other direction, that's when I can measure this difference in level or the pressure that is built up due to osmosis. Scientists have actually found a relationship between osmotic pressure and the amount of solute in a solution, in other words, a colligative property. Scientists have actually symbolized osmotic pressure with the symbol pi, and that is equal to the molarity of the solution times the gas constant times the temperature in K. So we're going to represent the concentration of my solute in my solution by molarity in this case, times the gas constant, times temperature in K.
In the example below, we'll actually use this relationship to calculate the osmotic pressure of a one molar glucose solution in water at 300 K. So pi again is my osmotic pressure. That's equal to the molarity of my solution, which is one mole per liter of glucose times the gas constant in liter atmospheres per K mole of 0.0825. 206 times the temperature of 300 K. Do the arithmetic. That equals to an osmotic pressure of 24.6 atmospheres. We can use this principle of osmotic pressure and osmosis to actually purify water. We call this process reverse osmosis. So if we set up an equilibrium where I have a semi-permeable membrane, I have pure solvent on one side, and I have a solution on the other side, if I apply a pressure to my solution side, I can actually force solvent molecules through my semi-permeable membrane, leaving my solute molecules behind and actually purifying my water. We do this all time using either desalinization processes for actually purifying seawater. So if I take seawater, which contains a lot of solute and a lot of different stuff, both living and ionic, I can actually apply a pressure in the presence of a semi-permeable membrane and force the water molecules through that semi-permeable membrane to actually purify water. And finally, we've come to the last section of the last chapter for this semester. We're going to discuss another variation in a solution called colloids. So let the celebrations begin. We spent just about all of this chapter talking about solutions. That is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances that are dissolved together. And it looks homogeneous here. A colloid is actually a homogeneous mixture that contains particles that are indefinitely sub suspended. For in this case, I, an example would be water. A suspension is slightly different. That's a heterogeneous mixture that contains larger particles that we can actually see, and they're temporarily suspended, like in orange juice here. So if we compare the three, I have a glass of water that has salt dissolved in it, that's a solution. Here I have a colloid, like a glass of milk, which has small particles that are actually suspended in it, but I could actually sort of look at it closely under a microscope and see those particles. We call this a colloid. If I have a suspension, I can actually physically see those particles, so this is not a homogeneous mixture, and it will separate out over time to form two different phases. In other words, the orange juice would settle to the bottom here, and the water would be my solvent. This slide looks closer at examples of solutions, colloids, and suspensions. For example, an example of a solution is actually salt water, either in an aquarium or out in the sea. So in this case, all these little red dots here represent very small ions and particles. They are dissolved in water, so they're completely dissolved, and they're very small. So this would be a homogeneous mixture. These particles never settle out. A colloid, on the other hand, has slightly larger particles. For example, in milk, I have particles that are represented either by fats or proteins that are dispersed throughout the liquid water, but they do not settle. A suspension would, would be an example of that would actually be mud. It is actually a heterogeneous mixture of particles suspended, and they look very cloudy and they do tend to settle out over time. So we're looking at just a size difference here in my particles. 
A solution has small particles. A colloid has slightly larger particles that still do not settle out due to the motions of all these particles. And finally, we have a suspension with large particles that can actually settle out over time. The difference between a colloid and a solution is very subtle. In fact, colloids are mixtures that look a lot like solutions. The main difference is, is that the solute particles in a colloid are much larger than the solute particles in a solution. In most cases, a colloidal solution actually is not transparent, meaning light does not get through a colloid, it is actually scattered. You can see that in milk, a colloidal solution of whipping cream, and a colloidal solution of mayonnaise. They are not transparent. An example of a colloid is actually jello. In this case, it is transparent. However, light still gets diffracted and it looks different. It is not a pure, uncolored, transparent solution. It is often challenging to distinguish between a solution and a colloid. One way to help is to shine light through each of these. When I shine light through a solution, there is no scattering of that light. It just propagates directly through that solution. When I shine light through a colloid, the light is scattered. It is actually dispersed in different directions. If I look at these two here, Notice that I've called this one a pure solution, and this one a colloid. I've actually called it a colloidal solution because they are very similar in properties. And that ends our discussion on Chapter 7. We will now move on to Chapter 8, where we will discuss rates in equilibrium plus we're going to add in some thermodynamic discussion into that also.